All right. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Patricia Teppenhart, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Strategic Initiatives with the New Jersey Chamber of Commerce. And I have the distinct pleasure of leading the New Jersey Chamber's work relating to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And prior to joining the team last August, our president and CEO, Tom Bracken, who is in our virtual audience today, solidified a partnership with our friends and colleagues at the African American Chamber of Commerce of New Jersey. And through this partnership, we identified five strategic DEI priorities, board diversity, supplier diversity, access to capital, corporate citizenship, and workforce diversity, the topic we'll be discussing today. I also wanna share that last year we held a series of regional receptions and a statewide dinner honoring champions of diversity throughout the state. This February, we launched our Supplier Diversity Collaborative, which now has 28 members, two of which are our panelists for today's discussion, Melissa Boardman and Nick Malafite. And we've also held a number of webinars where we've touched upon some of the strategic priorities I just mentioned. And relatedly, in April, we launched a workplace culture survey to the business community. The link for this survey is still open. I will share it as a follow-up to our conversation today but I think that our initial responses are some good context for today's conversation. 77% of our respondents indicated that they felt that DEI was a top commitment for their company. However, 76% of our respondents indicated that women of color comprise less than 10% of their company's senior leadership roles. So we see our role at the state chamber as being one that helps us all build businesses in better alignment with a shared vision for a more diverse, inclusive, and equitable business community. And this series of webinars being supported by Bank of America is designed to help us do just that. And the truth is that no matter the size of our business, making a commitment to more inclusive practices is a great place to start. And I know that it can feel overwhelming if you're running a smaller company without an HR department or DEI professionals on your team. And I know that because I've been there. For seven and a half years prior to joining the chamber, I led a statewide nonprofit. And for many years, I wore many, many hats. I was administration, operations, communications, government relations, and even human resources and recruiting. But what I've learned is that I do not, and we do not have to do this alone. And today we're going to have a conversation with some professionals who can give us some practical tips and suggestions on how to get started or even expand our efforts when it comes to building diverse teams. With that, let me introduce all of you to Joanne Millette, New Jersey Market HR Partner for Bank of America, who will kick off today's conversation. Joanne, I just wanna thank you and all of your colleagues at Bank of America for your consistent support of the New Jersey Chamber's DEI initiatives. And I'm happy to turn the microphone over to you. Great, thanks Patricia, so so happy to be here um, and appreciate the opportunity to, to have some opening remarks and, and also the great opportunity that Bank of America has to uh, you know, help you sponsor this, this, um, this six part series, really excited about that. And just a little bit about me. So I am a human resources manager here at Bank of America. I've been with the organization for over 25 years and my passion is people and I, and I get to do that every day as I support the local leadership in the New Jersey market. So over 10,000 employees that sit within this, this geographic area, I have the opportunity to engage with them to feel like they have an opportunity to grow a career here at Bank of America. They can bring their whole selves to work. And that is really what we do. And you know, when I think about um, the work that we do philanthropically with our communities, it's all tied back to diversity. It's all tied back to ensuring that we are giving back to the community. And a focus, you know, diversity is a focus in all that we do. Um, locally, our involvement, as I mentioned, with our nonprofits, with you as the chamber, with the Renew Jersey Council that we have, that we're in partnership with you, to really ensure that we are helping employees and all of our teammates, uh, every, all employees or all individuals in our communities have an opportunity for a job. And, um, you know, I just wanted to highlight a few things about us as, as a bank. You know, when I think about us as an organization, diversity begins with our people. And, you know, our goal is to ensure that we increase diversity of our workforce globally. And with a focus on mirroring the communities and clients that we serve, that is the heart of what we do every day and how we deliver for our clients. And, you know, leaders in our organization, they are held to commitments to ensure that they are driving an inclusive environment. It's one thing to think about diversity, but how do they drive inclusion? So when individuals work here at Bank of America, they feel like they can professionally grow 
and have um, a long um, career with us. And you know, leaders are focused on growing and developing that diverse, diverse workforce. It's important that they do that through internal and external hiring strategies. We have uh, you know, the ability to have many partners across the bank that drive that strategy to again, help you know, hire, develop and train and retain our talent. So, and we do that through external partnerships as well, as we mentioned you know, with you as the chamber and other nonprofits within um, the communities. And then we do that by ensuring, and I talked about the inclusion piece, because that's the really important part of what we do, ensuring that we're creating that inclusive environment where teammates can bring their whole selves to work. And we do that through ensuring that we're offering benefits and resources that support teammates' emotional well-being and, and benefits and, and other things that they may need to ensure that they can continue to have the support they need. And then we really drive opportunities for teammates to get involved in really first conversations that really talk about things that are important, things that are timely to the things that are going on in the community. And so we, we ensure that we're giving them the opportunity to be involved in those conversations and really think about education, awareness, and ensuring that diversity is the top of all of those conversations. And then lastly, you know, when I think about our philanthropic footprint and what we do here, it's engaging with our community partners to ensure that we are helping um, you know, communities, nonprofits around the state of New Jersey have an opportunity to talk about what we do as a bank, you know, whether that's being their, their bank of choice or being their employer of choice. And it really has all to do with that workforce development and growth. And so, you know, I think the conversation you're all going to have today, as you talked about, is the footprint to what organizations really have to do where teammates feel like they could can be their whole selves, um, you know, every day that they walk in the door of an organization. And that is the heart of what we do. So, Patricia, thank you for allowing me to have a few opening remarks and for all the support you lend to us as a bank through the chamber. Appreciate that. And I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Joanne. And thank you for doing such a great job kicking off this conversation. As we mentioned in the virtual green room before we got started and welcomed everyone today, we see this as being just a one-on-one -on -one level conversation and we endeavor to help build capacity over time. So today's conversation is gonna start with how do we get folks in the door and that starts with creating an inclusive and reduced bias you know, recruitment process. But Joanne, the things you spoke about are so critically important because getting diverse candidates in the door but then not shifting our culture and our practices to create inclusive environments, it's setting us up for failure. And so I'm very excited to see where these conversations take us. And I'm really thankful that we had you here. And again, all of the support that you've offered from Bank of America. And I'm looking forward to hearing from our colleagues, Nick and Melissa, as we kind of talk some nitty gritty about some tools and tricks that we could all employ. I wanna start really quickly by just sharing another statistic that I think is important as we frame out today's conversation. The US Census Bureau indicated that 85% of executive positions are still held by white professionals, 83% of senior manager positions, 77% of managers, and 64% of support and operations staff are all held by individuals who identify as white or Caucasian. And so the conversations that we're having today are about how do we build a bench full of diverse perspectives and lived experiences that will help us build diverse and inclusive teams so that they see, to Joanne's point, opportunities for growth within an organization. And sometimes that starts with having folks in the C-suite who look like you and have shared experiences like you. So let's get to it. I'm gonna welcome Nick Malafite and Melissa Boardman into the room today. I'm so thankful to have you both with us. With us. As I mentioned, Nick and Melissa are both parts of, are both members of our Supplier Diversity Collaborative. Um, in case you're interested in joining a Supplier Diversity Collaborative, we have 28 members in the collaborative so far. And it's a really interesting and diverse group of folks, both individuals who run women, minority, LGBTQ-owned companies, as well as individuals who are um, in companies that are looking to build out a supplier diversity initiative. And the conversations that we're having are allow us to speak with candor, allowing us to really get to the heart of what some of the longstanding barriers, challenges, and obstacles have been for um, competing in the market for minority-owned companies. And the goal here is to kind of create a different wheel 
right? We have the opportunity to learn from people who feel as if the processes and policies that are in place right now have not created equality of opportunity. And so as we are rethinking and reimagining what truly inclusive and accessible supplier diversity initiatives can look like, let's do things differently than they've been done before. And Nick and Melissa, you've been such great colleagues and assets to the conversations that we're having. And I'm looking forward to having you as part of today's conversation as well. I'm gonna ask Melissa, if you don't mind going first, if you just wanna introduce yourself to the audience, it'd be great to hear a little bit about who you are. Sure, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Melissa Boardman, the managing member of HR Consulting and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. We're a boutique full service professional service firm located in Hamilton, New Jersey. We're a diverse supplier for our clients, certified nationally by WeBank as a woman-owned business enterprise and a woman-owned small business. We're also certified by the state of New Jersey as a small business enterprise and a woman-owned business enterprise. As a WBE, we're fully committed to fostering, cultivating, and preserving a culture of diversity, equity, and inclusion within our organization and within the clients with which we work. Since 2006, we've been supporting our clients with our hiring needs related to finance and accounting, administrative back office, human resources, and customer service call centers, along with IT. Most of our clients have worked with us exclusively for many years because we have a personal and collaborative approach to doing business. After receiving my master's in IO Psych, I moved to New York City and fell into staffing. I've been working in the staffing industry for 25 plus years. I started as a recruiter, moved into management, and then became a staffing firm owner with my hands in, well, basically every aspect of the business, especially operations, human resources, and client relations. We are a small firm. Uh, as a woman, I personally experienced gender bias, which is why I originally started the firm and worked to be as inclusive and equitable as possible. Currently, my internal staff is 100% women, 60% over 40, and 60% racially diverse. Our consultants working at our client sites are just as diverse. Our recruiting philosophy is to create opportunity. We want our employees to be challenged and feel like an impactful yeah. part of a collaborative team while providing room for career growth. Um, and I'm happy to be here today and a part of this very important conversation. So Patricia, thank you so much for that. No, thank you so much for being here, Melissa. I'm looking forward to learning from you. I feel like I learned so much from you in our conversations in the collaborative, and this is just an extension of that. So thank you. Nick, if you'd like to introduce yourself to our audience, we'd love to know a little bit more about you. That's a tough act to follow. My <laughs> name is uh, Nick Malafite. I'm the president of Master Search Solutions. Um, I've been in the recruiting industry for 28 years. Um, really specialize in corporate staffing, so anything that you would find in a corporate office. Again, um, accounting, human resources, marketing, technology would be some of the core areas that my firm concentrates in. Um, I'm a past vice president of the New Jersey Staffing Alliance, where I also chaired the programs and education committee for the organization for five years. Um, on top of that, I also do own a martial arts school, and so I do teach both Korean and Filipino martial arts, which I've been actively involved with for over 40 years. So Nick Malafite, Master Search Solutions. Hopefully the content will make up for the lack of the introduction. <laughs> I think your introduction was perfect. This is going to be it a was. great conversation. Happy to have you both here. So let's dig in. Let's start with the most basic part yeah. of a recruiting process, which is the job description. So... You know, I know one of the things that I inherited in my previous job were job descriptions that were sort of like, quite honestly, like hodgepodge together, right? Like, oh, you know, in one year we had an opportunity to create these three staff positions. So the language was this way. And then maybe four more years, years later, we expanded the staff. And so maybe we had kind of fine tuned some of the language in our job descriptions, but they were kind of all over the place and they definitely needed some work when it came to accessibility, equity, and like reducing bias and even the wording of the descriptions. So let's have a conversation about how can we make the most inclusive job posting? How do we de-gender the language? How do we make it clear that we're looking for a diverse pool of candidates? Let's kind of start there. I'm happy to open it up to whoever would like to start. Um, I can start, is that okay? Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think the easiest way uh, when you're writing a job description would be to remove the absolutes. So if you take out the language like expert, leader, dominate, must have, required, um, that opens things up a lot. Um, I know it sounds counterintuitive uh, to do something like that, but if the goal is to reach a diverse pool of candidates, we have to assume that many marginalized candidates simply just haven't had opportunity uh, to step into those roles and those experiences. 
Um, when you would normally put the word required in for important skills, you can change that um, by using the word qualifications or preferred, um, and then add a statement that says you don't need to check all the boxes on the list below to apply. Um, that also will widen your diversity pool as well, because typically when it comes to gender, um, women will normally only apply to positions where they feel that they're a hundred percent match for that position, where men will often apply if they think they're a 60% match. So if you specifically state um, that you don't have to check every box, um, you're not going to um, lose any women that might've applied for the position. Um, let me think. I would also say that you can remove the requirement for a college degree. I think that's really important because college is a privilege, not a right. Um, and I think that um, unless the degree is absolutely imperative for the position, it shouldn't be there. Um, removing the number of years experience in the um, job requirement as well, how many years you have to have, um, because if somebody has four years or three years, um, they may not apply just because you're saying it has to have five to seven years of experience. Um, and then the one other thing that I would probably mention is um, eliminating the geographic boundaries. So if you open up your job or have the ability to open up your job to remote or a hybrid schedule, it can vastly increase your candidate pool. I love all of that. And I really appreciate you mentioning um, that women are looking for 100% alignment, whereas men are more inclined to sort of take the risk and take the chance and in creating any opportunity that we can to make anyone feel like there's an opportunity for them here. I also think it's super interesting, and this is a conversation perhaps to expand upon later, but there are a lot of conversations now around college degrees and their relationship to the professional careers that we pursue. And I know that you know Bank of America is the sponsor of this series, and they're really looking at innovative ways to sort of build the workforce from the ground up by working with corporations and institutions of higher education to create curricula that are very specific to particular job paths. Because, you know, I went to school for political science and I'm doing, you know, nonprofit work and membership work and, you know, business resiliency work. Um, I didn't learn most of these things in school. And so I really appreciate the opportunity for us to think creatively about the, for what purpose have we always held these things in our job descriptions? And can we create a mechanism by which the things that are in our job descriptions are completely intentional, not just sort of passed down because that's the way we've always done it. Mm -hmm. Nick, what do you want to add to the conversation? Sure, Melissa, that, those are all great points and thank you, Patricia. Um, so I'll, I'll see um, the things that we could add to this are, um, first of all, like using uh, neutral titles for positions, um, watching, uh, I think, uh, gender coded words. So sense tends to usually be uh, geared more towards women where like aggressive tends to be used more towards so gender coded else. words. I think that if we stick to words like they and you throughout the uh, job descriptions as opposed to he or she is a, a big place to start. I, I mean, a lot of the information that I'll provide today does come from my client base, which again, you know, hundreds of companies that I've worked with for many years. Um, and how they approach uh, their, their DE&I uh, work. So I think also uh, don't focus the post on uh, demographic, um, or again, we mentioned the experience level, but for example, like using phrases like young or energetic or junior or senior, unless, senior, unless that's like part of the job description or the role, like the actual job title, I don't think we need to put things like young or energetic or junior or senior. I mean, a lot of times people are putting that and we may get it, you may get into this with the pay equity later, but a lot of times people say that because of, you know, of what positions kind of pay. So I think we could watch for things like that. Um, also things like, uh, you know, I've seen uh, clients do things like, you know, strong command of the English language or uh, things like that. And, and I think, you know, may deter very qualified candidates from uh, applying that way. Um, the, the last few um, are more like just phrases or terminology, um, things like ability to complete tasks with or without assistance versus, you know, must be able to lift 50 pounds or, you know, must have access to reliable transportation versus must have a car, you know, so I think when we when we deal in absolutes, it's a little bit tough. 
I did want to just talk uh, kind of round things off on the education side of things. And um, while I agree, like if a position does not require a degree, I don't think we need to make it um, harder than it needs to be by adding the degree in. But I think that uh, people could also be more like-minded or, or more um, like inclusion-minded if they look at degrees that help them reach their like DNI goals. So, you know, I, I recently completed a search for a, a DE and I leadership role for a professional services firm. And, you know, one of the things that, that uh, was crafted in the job description is the degrees in things like women's studies or African-American studies or the L, you know, LGBTQ like things that are okay, this is who we're targeting if it makes sense to help them, you know, kind of reinforce that. It's also reinforcing their employer brand is committed to that. And I'll just, I'll end with saying like, re regarding the supplemental material, the employer brand in general, like, you know, really look at the, the website, the social media um, stuff that's going on about your company, the internal and the external communications that really like gear them also to show your commitment to diversity and to highlight the contributions that people are making from diverse populations or different walks of life. So, you know, yes, you know, if, if applicants or candidates are going to your website, you know, going to your social media pages, it's not just about the job description, make sure that these things all align in, in your overall approach to it. I love that point so much. Because I think one of the things we're hoping to do through our work around DEI at the Chamber is to help our colleagues in the business community weave these principles into the fabric of their company structure. And so it is really important to think about comprehensively how do we present ourselves as companies and business leaders that are wholly committed to these principles. And we were talking about this before we came in, but employees are very savvy and they can sniff out inauthenticity very quickly. And so when we so when we work on our job descriptions, and maybe we we do create really robust, thorough, accessible, inclusive job descriptions. And then if someone goes to our website, and even all of the like static images are folks that look like me, or the language is gendered, or there's no opportunity to transcreate content into other languages, people start to realize that it may just be performative. And so I think for our colleagues on the call who are just getting started, there are opportunities here to think like, what's the low hanging fruit? Let's start with the job descriptions, but let's not end with the job descriptions. Let's then also talk about how do we build out our language in other spaces and our graphics in other spaces that are in alignment with these things. And it's a journey as we all know, right? Like, and the language is also always changing as we think about inclusivity and we're listening to communities who have been historically marginalized, words or terms that may have been the premier words and terms to use even six months ago may now be shifting as we listen more to the communities who have been impacted by historical bias or discrimination. And so that's the other thing too, that this is dynamic work. We can think we've got the best sort of template for the job descriptions today. And then three months from now be like, oh my gosh, the language has changed. So we really have to keep our ears to the ground to make sure we're keeping up with the times. And speaking of that, there's a lot of talk right now, and I think that employers are really all over the board. So I think it's a good conversation, even if it's just planting a seed for consideration around including salary ranges in job descriptions. In fact, in New York City, the council recently amended the New York City human rights law to require that employers disclose salary ranges for all advertised jobs, promotion, or transfer opportunities. There was, as you can imagine, a lot of pushback and there was actually a delay in implementation because of COVID and things like that. But the conversations are happening and it's not just in New York City, but it is important because New York City is obviously a hot spot grabbing talent that we could keep here in New Jersey. So I'd love to hear a little bit about your thoughts or conversations that you've had with some of your clients around like, where are people right now on including salary ranges and what are some nuggets that we wanna leave our audience with today? I think that um, a lot of companies um, are a little apprehensive, um, but I don't think they should be. I, I think 
it, it does a couple different things. It can give you a competitive advantage, right? You, you know what your competitors are paying people so you can adapt um, for the market value that you're seeing out there if you have the ability to spend a little bit more to get higher quality candidates. Um, I think you can attract higher level candidates because they know what the salary is. They know that they fit the range. They know that you're within the same um, your mindset is exactly where they are. And you're not going to waste your time. You're not going to be interviewing people three rounds, four rounds of interviews. And then when it comes to the offer where you're actually offering the salary, you're not on the same page. And I think that point is really important, particularly as we think about our chambers membership, which is mostly mid and small size companies, your time is literally your money. And so as we think about going through rounds of interviews with candidates and then falling in love with someone and realizing that they're the perfect fit, but knowing that you just can't make it fiscally work, um, it's, it's a loss of value uh, resources, both for the candidate and for the company. Nick, what do you want to add to that? When I was on the corporate side, and I've been on the corporate side of recruitment as well as a director of talent acquisition for one of New Jersey's uh, well, New Jersey's largest uh, GPO. The, um, I, when I worked corporate, I thought it was great. I had no issues or problems. I do see pushback from some of my clients on it. Um, people, and most of it is also, you know, kind of on the flip side, it's like, I, I don't think that, you know, X needs to know what Y is making. It's none of their business. And so we, we do still see push back on that front from employers, you know, business owners who have definitely been hesitant, you know, smaller businesses like, so now people need to see what I'm paying. And so um, on the recruitment side, it's something that I'm not for, um, you know, quite honestly. So I don't want to kind of, you know, you know, make the waters murky or anything like that in regards to the conversation. But from a recruitment perspective, if I put a salary range on a position, higher level candidates may not apply, and then I'm missing out on the opportunity, and they're missing out on the opportunity to know what other future positions I'll have or what current positions I have for them that are outside of the salary band, and I don't know that until I speak with them. So it's like an old school, it, you know, it's an old school idea of not disclosing people's salary and, and what one person earns is, is the other person doesn't need to know. But it's not, you know, the way to show that we are being inclusive, that we are being fair, um, that wages are the same across the board for the same job. I mean, I know the intention, a lot of the intention is for gender. When New York, when New York was originally initiating this, I think that, that the thought process was more about gender um, and the wage gap there. Um, but I think in the end, if the companies can try to look at it from the perspective of, okay, I'm making sure that everybody who has this job title is within this range. And the only variation is based maybe on years of experience or um, something that they've done that may be different than another employee. Um, it also gives companies the opportunity to increase their current staff salaries if they're not in line with what the market is paying. And that can also be scary to a small organization who doesn't really have the funds to increase rates or doesn't think that they should have to increase rates. But in the end, if you want to hold on to your employees and have retention, you need to be where the market falls. Hi, Julie. I love all of that. And I think one of the things that we experienced, so as I mentioned before I came here, I, I was the executive director of a, a statewide nonprofit and we were really trying to shift our practices. And so Melissa, to your point, we created very, quite honestly, very large ranges for salaries within certain levels, right? So if you were a coordinator, you knew your range was this. If you were a manager, you knew it was this. And what it also did over time was it created, honestly, less staff attrition because folks knew where there were opportunities for growth. And they also knew what the structural limits were on their salary for the position that they had. It created a lot more accountability for us as well, which is scary, right? Like it is, it is, a, it is a real shift in practice. I also hear you, Nick, on your side as a recruiter that losing an opportunity to meet with a candidate who may not be right for that position, but you know they're right for another position, you don't wanna miss out on those opportunities. And so I think these are conversations that we need to keep having. 
I think it's also, again, an opportunity to really think about how do we stretch out of our comfort zone to build inclusive spaces? And there's no perfect fix to all of it. And we also don't have to do all of it overnight, but we should be thinking about all of these things. And as we also know, you know, and New York City is a great example of this, sometimes things are placed upon us as responsibilities without us having a choice. And so, you know, if you're an employer in New York City, you now have to do this. And so we need to be mindful of sort of shifts in policy and practice across the country, because if it's happening in New York City, it could also very easily happen here. And we need to be prepared and start feeling comfortable with those kinds of things. Let's shift now. Okay, so we've got this really amazing, very inclusive, totally accessible, on the up and up job posting. We're ready to launch. And where the heck do we put it? Because what we'll often hear is I post the jobs and it's not my fault I don't get a diverse you know, selection of candidates. And I think you've both heard me give this analogy before. Again, in my previous job, um, we would work with direct service providers and we would collect data on the clients that they were serving. And historically across the map through 21 counties, predominantly, the people who were being served were white, heterosexual, cisgender women of you know, middle socioeconomic status. And we would ask like, where is there such a disconnect between the really diverse communities in which we live and work and the clients that we're serving? And we would get answers like, I don't know, we have a, you know, a pride flag hanging out front or like, you know, we put stuff on social media that says, you know, we are in support of, you know, Leah, diversity. Leah, and right here's your tables. Can, can I just ask if you're not muted to please mute? I can't go through and find out who it, who it is. Thanks. Um, so what are some of the strategies, strategies you've used as recruiters some unique or um, innovative places where you've started posting job descriptions to help really increase the diversity in the pool of candidates that are coming forward. Nick, let's start with you this time. Okay, uh, I guess <laughs> back in the, uh, in the 90s when I first got into the recruiting industry, the firm that I worked for had a slogan. And the slogan is kind of, you know, we live where our candidates live. And, and I thought that was very forward thinking. Um, and this was a certified um, woman owned business that I had worked for for 14 years. And, um, you know, and, and uh, it was from leadership down that, uh, you know, I truly believed in that. So back then, um, it was things like going into a bodega um, in Elizabeth and posting a help wanted sign. Uh, was looking for bilingual Spanish talent for warehouse work. Um, it was uh, things like going into a Korean church and meeting with the pastor and asking if they would make an announcement, um, of, you know, to their congregation about, you know, a position that we were working on, or at least facilitating an introduction. And, and really what this became was the, the, you know, on a deeper level, this was really the beginning of, you know, relationship building networking, if you will. And so, you know, I think, um, Patricia, a lot of people like you, you know, the first thing we kind of go to is posting. You know, you had mentioned, you know, posting and, and like right away I go, stop, just just stop. And I'll get to posting in a second. But, you know, um, on a deeper level, when you get to know the owner of the bodega or you get to know the owner of the, you know, or the pastor at the church, you know, they start referring people to you. You know, much like the chamber has been great at referring, you know, people and, and business to me in the past, you know, so I think it's it's really getting to know people that way. And like, let's, you know, I'll just go through a couple of the key things, like from an education standpoint, on a large scale, it becomes, well, let's post a position on handshake, okay, and, you know, see, see what we come up with, you know, but really a, a slightly deeper level would be forming a relationship with the people in the career center of the school and one where when students are, are walking in, you know, or alumni are walking in uh, and talking to the career center, you know, I went to Seton Hall, so I always fall back and I use Seton Hall as the example, you know, if you don't know Jorge or, or you don't know, you know, uh, you, you know, the people in the career center, you haven't really gone, you know, deep enough. And so if you get those personal relationships and then Education wise, even more like, let's say, okay, you're, you don't want to post it on handshake. You want to deal with the career center. 
you could also deal directly with certain department heads or even the administrative or the administrators of those departments. So, you know, like, I mean, I, you know, I know the administrator of the psych department when I'm looking for people who have psychology degrees, you know, um, so it's really, really establishing those kinds of relationships and, you know, just start to research for employers that are looking for different ways to find people, start to research all the things. Google is a wonderful tool, right? So you have things like HBCU Connect, which is a, a network of, of students that come from historically black colleges. Um, and that happens at, at every level, like, you know, Seton Hall, the law school has a, um, you know, they, they have a black law students uh, association or society. Again, you know, if I was looking uh, to target diversity that way, it's really forming connections with those people. Google upcoming diversity job fairs. I mean, see what's coming up in your area that is spotlighting or highlighting that. And then, you know, Patricia, I go back to your uh, community organization. Um, I've, you know, in the past, I, I have dealt with things like battered women's shelters or in Newark, I dealt with an organization that dressed men, uh, you know, up for success on interviews, you know, but it's forming the relationships with, uh, with those types of organizations, you know, with the Chamber of Commerce, you know, I, you know, not just our chamber, which, which I, you know, which I love, obviously, but when, when you talk about like the statewide Hispanic Chamber of Commerce has a job board you could post on for free if you're a member. I mean, you know, look at Pride, you know, look at, look at, look at the different uh, organizations that are out there, the Pride Chamber or the African American Chamber and establish relationships with those. And, and like, uh, there's probably like three or four more, Melissa, and then you know, I don't want to usurp everything. No, no, actually, you no, know, you were great. I'm, I'm literally uh, highlighting in front of me all of the things that were. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, um, I'm, you have, uh, I think if there was anything, I'm yeah. sorry, go ahead. No, no, you have professionals like attorneys, uh, employment attorneys are great people to know because they know what's going on with somebody's situation. Of course, there's all kinds of confidentiality things, you know, accountants, People complain to their accountants, their public accountants all the time about what they made, what they didn't make, what their taxes were, what bracket they're in. Real estate agents know who's coming in, who's going out. I mean, like, there's so much like, uh, so I said, I, I own a martial arts school in addition to recruiting, right? So, you know, I have three students that own their own martial arts schools. Collectively, they have access to over a thousand families. One student has 400 students. You know what I mean? Like, it, then if you look at like your local gyms, your, your gymnastics facilities, your dance facilities in the communities that you're looking to recruit from, these people have access to, to thousands of families. And, and I'll, I'll end on just the LinkedIn side of things, right? Like, you know, you, you can post on your personal page, what position you have, you know, your company page. It doesn't cost much, if, you know, to have a company page that you could start to brand your firm and highlight some of your benefits on your company page. But more importantly, I would say like, look at LinkedIn groups, you know, like look at the, the global diversity and inclusion group that's on LinkedIn. Are you a member of it? Like now, again, there may be specific types of people that you're targeting and, you know, girls who code, I, I don't know, but there's plenty of things that you can, you know, you can look into and you can engage. And the last thing that I would, I would say is um, encourage referrals from diverse employees internally. Like spotlight them, highlight them wherever you can. And I could go on, I did it- uh, uh, Yeah, that was great. For last was year great. On, on recruiting resources, but <laughs> I'll let you go. That was actually perfect, Nick. Um, I think if, if I were to add anything to that, which it's hard to do, um, I think that I would be I... looking, no, 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 it's good, it's good. I think I would be looking at um, focusing on the posting side. So you spoke on the referral side and um, social media and um, just going out and networking. And I, I think more than anything, that's probably the most important um, things that you can do. But in addition to that, you know, as a company, sometimes that takes time. Um, and it is, it is a, a long process, but it's a very rewarding one in the end. Um, but I think that when you're looking at like, okay, I have an immediate need and I need somebody to start um, next week and you don't, maybe don't have the context quite yet, right? Maybe you're just starting out or you're a smaller firm. Um, 
depending on some of the sites that you post on. So um, as you had mentioned, you can do, you know, colleges, alumni associations, um, professional groups. Um, you had also mentioned, I think, um, the different chambers, you can post on those for free. Um, I know that if you do happen to use Monster in your searching, um, they have like 39 plus uh, diversity partners that when you post with them, it goes out to the other diversity websites for free. Um, I also know that it can be um, really uncomfortable to Google. I know that like Nick mentioned how important Googling is and it is important, but like nobody feels comfortable, you know, Googling um, Asian jobs or African-American jobs. It just feels uncomfortable. Um, so you have to make that intention because that is actually what those job sites are called, right? You're gonna have an African-American job site. You're gonna have diversity.com, hispanicjobsite.com. You're gonna have job sites that are actually called that that you can post on. So you do wanna try to utilize that function. Um, and then in addition to some of the other, um, utilizing the LinkedIn groups for like women in tech and things like that, you can also do Google Boolean searches, right? For the same thing, women in tech, STEM women, uh, that type of thing can be really helpful. I love this. I took a bunch of notes. And I think that, you know, the, the one thing that I'm hoping that we can take away from this part of the conversation is, again, to do the work really woven into the fabric of our business is stuff that takes time, right? So the relationship building and all of that outreach, those are sort of the long-term goals. And also though, there are things that we can do kind of going back to the very beginning of the conversation, like making a commitment to do something differently than how we've been doing it is a great place to start. And so for all of our colleagues who are on this call, who are figuring out how to get started what we've done is created an opportunity to understand that there's a place where we can start with changing up our job descriptions, looking at different places to post them and move into a phase where we're perhaps building out even our own staff capacity to build some of those relationships and do some of those, you know, organic or, or necessary um, outreach strategies that will help us build those relationships. And all of it takes time. And it's an investment in doing business differently than usual, which I think is why we're all here today. I wanted to ask, and we don't have to touch upon this for, for long, because there's a one more section that I want to make sure we get to, but I'd like to just sort of ask if either of you have experiences with any of your clients considering alternative ways to receive information from applicants. Now, I know you both as recruiters are often the ones receiving the cover letters and the resumes and funneling them back out. But if I'm um, an employer and I'm looking for candidates, traditionally we're asking folks to create a resume and a cover letter. Usually we want it PDF'd. I'm a huge nudge and I used to want them PDF'd into one document. Looking at that, that now and thinking about all of the accessibility issues with that, like I would definitely not do that practice again. And then it has to be attached to an email and all of these things generally require a computer and software and then internet to that computer, whereas most people are doing work on their phones these days. So do you have any thoughts or insight about how that practice for submission, submitting your content for jobs may be changing um, so that it's more accessible through usage of phones? Um, so I, I really put a lot of thought into this one and I was having a very difficult time coming up with an answer, to be honest with you. Um, the only thing that I would say is uh, for like your website, you could put a clickable button on your website that just has them literally put in nothing but their name, phone number, email address, that's it. Um, just so you have the contact with them. Um, you could set up like a dedicated phone line that people could maybe text information to, but all those things are, you know, it's expensive, there's costs associated with them. So I don't know if I would really do that. Um, I, I think just making your positions accessible to people um, should be sufficient with a way for them to respond to you, whether or not they're including a resume or not. We don't always get a resume. Sometimes people will just reach out and they'll just say that they're looking for work and we'll go into the conversation of what do you do? What are you looking for? And, um, you know, do you have a resume? And if you don't, how can I help you? Um, you know, so I, I think that's unfortunately the best. <laughs> I really couldn't think of anything for this. No, I appreciate, I appreciate that. I think it's something I've been thinking about. Um, 
as we're thinking about like a new generation of people who don't even really use laptops so much anymore. And so just thinking of maybe just planting the seed now about how do we build build a better plane so folks can hop on differently. Nick, what are your thoughts? I feel the same way that Melissa does. I, I really struggled finding like, a, you know, an alternate way. It's, it's still, you know, people have been made aware of the position and they, you know, they apply. I mean, we could talk all day about applicant tracking systems and we could talk all day about, you know, making the process easier for candidates so that things move faster. But as far as how it's happening, I mean, you know, I, I believe it's going to happen more and more via mobile devices, you know, but I think it's still the same process. They're still, you know, probably uploading a resume. They're still filling out uh, some sort of an application, you know, just util utilizing that device. So I, I don't see anything new. So if we could come up with that, I think yeah. nobody <laughs> else on this call, leave this all private. Let's come up with something together. Right. You know, there's your retirement plan. I mean, look, 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 we have some of the best and brightest business leaders in the country as part of the state chamber. We have a bunch of them on today's call. We have our colleagues in the Department of Labor who are really working. That's Joe Forte, who's in the in the chat box really working on DEI at the state level. And so I absolutely think, look, New Jersey is known for its innovation. We have now identified that perhaps there's a different way to do things. We don't have to have it figured out right now, but I'm pretty confident if we put our brains together, we can come up with something which will really increase the competitive edge we can have here in New Jersey. So we have 10, eight minutes left, and I wanna get to another sort of like the third piece in the recruiting process. And, and, and leave our colleagues who are on the call today with some nuggets to consider. So we've talked about accessible job descriptions, casting a wide net, building relationships to facilitate better recruiting. What are some strategies we can employ to reduce bias during the interviewing and selection process? And so some points that I'm hoping we can touch upon are the concept of blind screening candidates, any thoughts on virtual versus in-person interviews or phone screenings, and then are there any questions we should or absolutely should not be asking as we aim to create a more equitable selection process? That's a lot of content to cover in a short amount of time. So I feel like we need a 101 version two where we can bring you both back, but let's see what we can cover while we still have time here today. Who wants to go first? You can go Lisa, first. do you want to go? I'll go. Um, okay, so that yeah, that's fine. So with, um, yeah, I do think that blind screening can be helpful on resumes. So you take the name off of the resume when you're giving it to the manager um, and put a number on the resume instead. Um, there, there is definitely an unconscious bias that comes into place with names on resumes. So um, it could be um, the schools that someone attended as well um, can cause some bias on a resume. Um, people just have impressions um, and implicit bias, even whether it's negative or positive is still not a good thing, right? There's so many different types of bias that we don't even sometimes know that we have. So I think the most important thing is being aware of that um, and, and not being afraid to address it. Um, you can also remove the address on a resume because sometimes um, when you have the address there, that can help uh, to, when you remove the address, it can help to limit the socioeconomic bias that's associated with that. I love it. Thanks so much, Nick. Okay. Um, let's uh, start, if possible, with assembling a diverse interview panel, if possible. I mean, sometimes, you know, if it's limited, the, if it's a small business, the owner might be the owner. But I mean, you know, if we can build more inclusive interview panels, that might be a good place to start and start a comfort level off, right? I think if we ask standardized questions, so, you know, ask every single candidate the same questions, you know, some people uh, also on this line of things would advocate like a checkbox or a scorecard box to kind of make sure that everything is, everybody's got a level uh, playing field that way. Um, Melissa had mentioned, um, online unconscious bias. Um, I would definitely recommend checking out Trailiant. If nobody has checked out Trailiant.com before, um, I, you know, uh, I think I have a PowerPoint where I have listed a lot of the recruiting resources. If anybody wants it, just let me know. Also the website address for Trailiant. So uh, they have like uncover your unconscious bias training so that you could be aware of that. Um, Follow some people on LinkedIn that speak to DE and I. Um, 
people who may be interviewing all the time. I follow uh, somebody named Cheryl Ingram, uh, PhD, she's a PhD. And, um, you know, she likes these questions as far as like uh, uh, the playing field, like or one in particular, what does inclusion feel like for you while you're at work? I love that because I mean, again, this is like, you know, you can try and get, you know, gauge what person is somebody's really feeling like, and they're, they're in their current situation. So, you know, what does it feel like when it's right? What does it feel like when it's wrong? She's got a list of wrong feelings, which is great to look at because you can look at it and you can see how people answer questions and what, what's really coming out. Um, others that I like myself, uh, questions that I ask are demonstrate how you show respect for other people in the workplace and their differences. And also tell me about a time where you worked to understand another person's perspective. So this kind of just opens up things to saying, you know, if somebody really struggles with that answer, you may wonder, like, you know, do you consider other people's perspective? <laughs> or, you know, is your perspective the only perspective? So I, I think like that that's another really good from an interview perspective. I, I don't normally I have a list of don't ask questions. Um, I don't have that for specifically for D, you know, DE and I. So that's something that I'll work on in the future, though, um, just for my own. I, I love that. Oh, I'm sorry, Melissa, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just going to say um, it's important to be honest with yourself about your biases as well. Right. It, being aware um, that you may have some biases um, can help you move past them as well in the interview process. And you want to really um, think of each person as an individual. Um, I think a lot of times what happens during the interview process, especially for us, is we're reviewing so many resumes um, and you start to compare the resume based on, um, you know, multiple factors within them, but then you're not, you're raising the bar as you're going along instead of looking at each person as an individual. Does this person fit the skill set and the needs for the position, regardless of what these other 100 people do or don't do? Um, and I think you want to try to change your outlook um, to prevent your, uh, uh, I'm sorry, your uh, attribution bias, because you need to give credit where credit's due. So a lot of times what happens is people will think um, that somebody was lucky when they fell into the situation or they took that. And then if they, if they did something wrong in a position or that something was negative there, that it was because of a fault of their own, um, and which isn't necessarily true. So I think those are, important factors to kind of take into place as well. I have loved this conversation. I feel like I have learned so much. I hope that our colleagues who are on the call have learned a lot too. And I also wanna add, I love the idea of us thinking those, Nick, the questions that you offered as suggestions are great because they speak to the next part of the conversation, which is making sure that we're building good inclusive cultures. And so if our focus is only on skills or experiences, we might be bringing someone in who is statistically qualified, but culturally not a good fit. And then that just creates additional challenges. And we kind of wasted all of our investment and time and resources in bringing someone on who ultimately is either gonna create challenges with our other colleagues that we respect and want to retain, or they themselves are gonna self-select out. And then we have to go back through the process all over again. I feel like there is so much more we can cover I want to ask if either of you have any last minute pieces of wisdom or insight that you'd like to share with our audience before we wrap up today. I think um, the only thing that I would want to say is don't think the DEI initiatives and um, hiring processes associated with them have to be a very particular way. You'll find what works for you and your company. I think the most important step in the first step that you need to take is just having intention. That is the most important thing that you can possibly do. And then putting any form of action uh, into place. I love it. Nick? I agree. It's just getting started, you know, and it doesn't take a lot to get started. So when you have resources, and, and again, I know how people feel about Google, but if you struggle, Google, it's a great place to start. I love it. I think that we are ending where we started, which is just getting started is a, is a space for progress to, to begin. Um, I wanna invite all of you to join us on July 20th at 9 a.m. 
We'll have a second conversation in our series sponsored by Bank of America talking about supplier diversity. And also to join us, I think it's, oh my gosh, I didn't write this down. I think it's July 27th, but I'll send it out as a follow-up email. We have another series of conversations about women in the work workplace. And we'll be joined by Navy Commander Avita Salas, who is from New Jersey, and she'll be talking about some of the really innovative things the Navy is doing to increase gender inclusivity, which will really leave some food for thought for all of us across the New Jersey business community. I will follow up this email with a link to our workplace culture survey. I'll include um, Nick and Melissa, if you're comfortable with it, I'll include links to your website so people know how to reach out to you to get additional information or support. I wanna thank all of you for being here today. I have to say, I've been following the participants and this is one of the conversations where we've retained the highest number of people right on through to the end, which is a real testament to both Nick and Melissa, your very like tangible, practical um, suggestions and tips that you're providing to everyone. Thank you again to Bank of America for supporting this conversation. And thank you to Tom Bracken, our CEO, um, for giving us the space to really dive deep into our work around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And in the chat box, we see Bill Hageman, who is the co-chair of our board's DNI committee. It is truly an all hands on deck initiative here at the State Chamber. I'm very proud to have an opportunity to lead this initiative to Melissa and Nick. Thank you for what you do every day. Thank you for sharing some of your expertise with us and all of our colleagues. And we will see you all again very soon. Stay safe and enjoy your wonderful day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.